first up um, is obviously myself. Hello, I'm Claire. Um, and I'm obviously a uh, high rocks. I compete mostly doubles. I do love a bit of doubles. If any of you are on here tonight doing doubles, um, you can by all means ask Emma, myself, even Jay, of course, some tips on that. Emma's waving in the background. Um, I also done a bit of emceeing for High Rocks and I'm a strength and conditioning coach, running coach and overall PT and online coach. So I'm going to be sharing with you guys the kind of first things tonight about first time High Rocks is some of the biggest mistakes that I personally made um, and then some of the biggest mistakes that I actually see when doing high rocks um and then leading on from me is going to be emma emma is going to be taking you through all things foot analysis gait analysis running footwear she is a running coach by trade and i'll let her properly introduce herself and then the headliner the big guy the well, actor, <laughs> jay's like not me but i'm super excited to be working with jay on this tonight so um thanks to nat who i think is on the call for getting jay and i introduced um and jay is obviously high rocks elite he's also a gb athlete um pt online coach he's got an epic background epic story and a lot of knowledge to share with you guys tonight so i'm super excited for him to properly take you through what he's going to chat about and hopefully you will find it also very useful as i said first high rocks to competing and multiple high rocks is how do you get to that world champs or even elite level if that's your goal so I'm going to start off with the key things that I wish I had known for my first high rock so this is a snippet overall of the things that I kind of want to talk to you guys about and the biggest thing and the, the biggest thing that not only do I preach about now as a coach um but is start slow to finish fast. So it's not like in your training. So when you're in your training, like most of us are only doing 45 to 60 minute sessions a lot of the time. We're going in, we're going guns blazing, we're going full steam ahead and it's all fun, it's all games, it's incredible. And we think, yeah, okay, I just did my eight by one Ks at five minutes to split. So I'm going to go and I'm going to do high rocks at that pace and it's going to be incredible. And then people set off on the track and they go out and everybody's running and they're trying to keep up with the person at the front because they want to lead the pack and nine times out of ten what we see is people start high rocks and their first one kilometer is their best one kilometer generally from that point forward they start to increase they start to slow down on each of those runs and actually finish a lot lot slower than what they started so what we want to see is actually people starting slow and finishing fast so what i do what emma does and what we definitely even do in pairs is when we're going out, we actually stay at the back of the pack and we run our own lap. We stay behind abs. We just let everyone go. Just let everyone get excited. The Red Bull screaming, shouting, MCs are hyping. Everyone bursts and we actually stay at the back of the pack and just let them all go. And then we find that by the time we come off the ski, we're generally the first people off the ski and moving back out. And it's purely because people go out so fast. They're then gassed as they come into that ski. They're not ready to maintain that pace and immediately things start to slow down. So really think about that in your training and in your approach and be mindful of the pace that you start that first kilometer at. It is not a 1 kpb. It is eight one kilometers that you want to have the same length, same time. Um, a big thing that also I wish I'd known before is obviously not watching people before my race. Now, it is super challenging if you've got a partner that's maybe doing men's doubles and you're doing women's doubles and chances are men's doubles is on eight o'clock in the morning and women's doubles isn't on until five o'clock at night. You're going to be like, oh, I want to go. I want to support them. And then you end up being there the whole day. And being in that environment with 4,000 spectators and 4,000 athletes is energy draining. So really try to be mindful about your approach to the event. Like, of course, you want to be able to go and celebrate people, but maybe go in, see 10, 15 minutes of someone's race and actually get yourself out of the building and get yourself out of the venue. You want to be making sure that if it is your race, you're rocking up maximum 90 minutes before your actual event to drop your bag, to get moving, to obviously get that good proper warm up and then actually get going you want to keep as much energy as you can in yourself and of course be able to smash your event I really wish I'd known that because by the time it came to my first race I was tired from being in the venue and it was like drinking all the caffeine and hoping that something was going to get me going now of course the crowds get you going but ultimately you need to have that energy for 90 minutes, maybe even two hours for some of you if it's your first time. So don't go too early and drain yourselves before you go. 
Another key thing that I wish I'd known is obviously using gels and electrolytes in training. Now, if you do not come from a running background, chances are you're not using gels or electrolytes in your training sessions because why would you need to, right? We go to the gym, we do a 45, we do a 60 minute session, we leave. We're not really thinking about these things. So just, I wish I'd known to test a couple of gels because in all honesty, I got a really upset tummy during my first high rocks. It is not the one. I was running with a sore belly from about 30 minutes in. I really struggled to finish the back half of the race just because my tummy was in bits from the gel that I chose to have. And it just did not work well for me. So key thing with that is to make sure you're testing maybe in your longer runs, which Emma's going to chat to you about, um, and just starting to test with gels and electrolytes as you prep over the kind of few weeks building up to your event so that you know what works for you. If you're going to be out there for 90 minutes plus, you're going to want to use a gel or electrolyte at some point in that race. And it's just making sure that you've tested for that length of time with that specific product. Um, practicing heavier weights. All right, guys, most of you will have heard all the drama, I'm sure at some point about the blinking high rock sleds. And they are standardized, okay? The weights are not different at different events and different courses and whatever. The weights are the same. It's purely because we go in there, we put a little bit of fatigue in our legs. As I said, adrenaline's picking up, body's a little bit all over the place. And then we try to push that sled or we try to pull that sled and it's like, oh my gosh, it's a dead weight. It feels like a dead weight. We blame the carpet. We blame absolutely everything known to man. And ultimately, you just need to get good in your own training at practicing with heavier weights because adrenaline, all these different stimulus in your body, everything going on that start to build up of lactate in your legs, the weights are going to feel heavy on the day, all right? You have your own opinions on the carpet, get out there, try it. Personally, I've never had a problem with the carpet. I've never had a problem with the floor. I've just prepared with heavier weights and knowing that that fatigue is going to be in my body and I'm going to be able to move the sled regardless. Don't let that get in your head and don't start making excuses about the weights being heavier or the blinking carpet, if I have to say it once more time. Um, next up is obviously I get all my clients to make sure that they are comfortable running 10K. So I really wish I'd prepped 10K a couple of times in the lead up to my High Rocks event just to make sure that that running base was there. So again, when I went to my first High Rocks event, I was kind of running now and again, wasn't really running consistently. I was one of those people that, you know, rocked up, thought I'm fitness, I'm healthy, I can do this. It's only eight one Ks. I do that all the time in training. And, you know, it took me by an absolute storm and I actually really, really struggled um, to last that dur duration without getting super gaffy and super uncomfortable. So a big thing I wish I had done in advance was just practice running 10K, getting comfortable running that 10K and getting good at doing it in, you know, 60 minutes. And if you can get good at that 10K in, you know, 60 minutes, maybe 70 minutes for some of you, then incredible. Just get super comfortable at running that distance for your first time. And that'll go massively when you come into that race. And then the last one that I wish I'd known was obviously to test my footwear as much as I say I didn't have issues with this lead the first time I did my high rocks my shoe slipped off it was my own fault I didn't know anything I just tied my shoes and went and you live and learn okay you live and learn so Emma's going to talk to you guys about footwear and how you can actually lace your shoes to massively help you so you don't make the same mistakes that I made going into my first event <clears throat> I've only got one more slide don't worry Okay, my second slide that I'm coming to chat to you guys about is obviously the biggest mistakes that I see people making. So obviously a lot of those mistakes are the mistakes that I kind of just briefly went over there. Go figure. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've kind of just spoke about that we see, I wish I'd known my first High Rocks event, is of course the mistakes that people are making. But another couple of things that just as a coach now, being in this game now for two and a half, nearly three years, and actually starting to work with a lot of people and having people come to me and ask me questions. These are some of the, the key mistakes that I am seeing again and again. And we don't want you guys tonight who've showed up to come here to give us your attention to then make these same mistakes. And the big thing that, that is a big bugbear for me is people think to get good at high rocks, let's just keep doing high rocks over and over and over again. So the amount of people I see, oh, they, they did a simulation 10 weeks out and then they do another simulation eight weeks out and then they've done a simulation again six weeks out and they're just constantly taking their Saturdays to do the High Rocks event. 
the amount of stress that you are putting on your body doing that event is insane. You're absolutely frying your central nervous system. You're pushing your body into a lot of lactic acid and you're going to create so much build up in the muscles that it's going to actually take you a good few days to recover from that. But people aren't then taking that recovery. They're doing the event, they're getting straight back into training and then they're doing it again two weeks to try to get better at it. And my biggest mistake that I see is people doing this. Maybe do a simulation once in your training and don't even do the full thing. Like if it is your first event, just listen to a coach, listen to the advice out there and actually prep all the stations and prep all the training styles, but ultimately get yourself to position where when you do that high rocks event, it's your first real run through. It's your first big go at it and use that first run as your first learning experience. It doesn't need to be a world record. It doesn't need to be the be all end all. This is my one event. I'm going to go crush it and make it the best of my life. That first event is a learning experience. So let's remember that and let's treat that first event for what it is. It's the first time really trying to do it and, and getting those levels up. Obviously, with that then comes that overtraining that I'm kind of talking about and people starting to peak too soon. Now, I probably did that myself last year. I peaked for London in April and then went on a bit of a downward spiral and the lead up to Vegas in May. And it did not serve me well because I thought I'll be able to maintain this intensity We'll smash London in April and I'll be able to ride this high for two weeks. Fatigue is real. It kicked in. Obviously, with the, the long flight to Vegas, I really felt the impact of overtraining and of not resting. Now, yes, I did manage to get through the event. And yes, we got an incredible time. We got our own PB. But I wouldn't have been able to do that without Emma literally shouting at me and making me move because I was I was so broken. And she will not lie, I pretty much moaned for an hour and seven minutes. Do you know, I was just not in the right headspace. And it took all the joy out of why we were there in Vegas and why we were there doing world champs. Because I was just so like, I am not physically or mentally in the place for this right now. So that's just my big warning to you is remember again, like why we're doing this and why we love this. And just try to, to, to save the energy and save everything for that big experience. Don't go too hard too soon. Um, another last couple of things for me is obviously that mental plan. So this is something that um, I think Jay is going to touch on just a little bit later on. So I'm not going to go too much into this. But again, when people get to the wall balls, you see them break down. I actually, when I was emceeing at Glasgow, um, had someone sadly who quit on the wall balls. She was like, I'm done. I'm just done. I cannot finish these. She was like, this is too much for me. And I was just like, my heart was breaking at that moment in time because I was like, you've just ran eight 1Ks, you've complete seven stations and you're just saying, I'm tapping out with the wall balls. Like her mental game was just not there. And this is the big thing that you need to get stronger mentally as well as getting fitter and as well as getting physically stronger. So if you don't have a mental plan for going into your high rocks or maybe you haven't been testing that mental capacity in training, now is the time to start doing it, especially if you've got London coming up or you've got an event coming up in the next couple of months. Like really start to tap into that mental chatter and what you say to yourself when the wheels start to come off. How can you keep yourself in the game and how can you keep yourself moving forward? I'm going to leave that for Jay. Okay, next up um, is obviously losing time on silly mistakes. So again, just things like dropping the bag um, and the lunges and, you know, dropping the ball and just standing, looking around on the wall balls and like waiting for someone to come and help you. No one's coming to help you. You're doing it yourself. Or things like the burpee broad jumps, like lying on the ground and just, you know, wasting all that energy lying on the ground and then, you know, jumping up and exploding forward as far as you can rather than thinking about, you know, slowing things down and just walking the feet out walking the feet in, taking a little jump and just really getting that control. So people losing time on things that they, they really shouldn't be losing time on just because they've not researched the rules of the game or they've not read up on the, the skills and the technique standards. So make sure it's not you. Make sure you're not the person that puts your hands on the floor when you go to start those burpees and you're in front of the line. You know, you're just wasting time. Make sure you know, okay, hands behind the line, I got this. Make sure you know when that bag is on your shoulders and the sandbag lunges, that bag doesn't get dropped. That bag is on your shoulders the whole time, whether you like it or not. If you're doing doubles, you pass it to the next person on your shoulders. You don't drop that bag on the ground. It's not worth it. 
just making sure that in the slide stuff you're staying in the box you're keeping the sled in your lane little things like that transitions on and off the roar ski all these things especially if you are doing pairs are super super essential and with that please try to keep running in the rock zone now I know it's hard and we all want to slow down but again a massive piece of advice you can save seconds minutes even over the duration of the event if you can try to just keep that jog going through the rock zone and if you don't know what that is do your research all right Last one is obviously, just to summarise before I pass on to Emma, is obviously that whole notion of putting too much pressure on yourself for the race. The amount of clients I get that are like, yeah, I'm going to do one hour 15. And I'm like, okay, cool. But have you ever done anything like this before in your life? And the reality is no, they haven't. So just make sure you're not setting time goals that are, out with your your current grasp like really start to understand your fitness understand your strengths and have that conversation with someone to understand where where should you be aiming for and actually for you would it be a better idea to just get out there and run the race and forget about the time forget about everything else just try to get to the finish line and be bloody proud of yourself for completing the race you know if it's your first time you just want to get it done you want to check a box and you want to be like hey I am badass I am amazing I smashed this yeah all right if you do have any questions on everything I have just chatted at you guys for the last uh, however many minutes um please pop your questions in the chat box I'm gonna have a look at that as we introduce Emma I'm just gonna move out my seat and she's gonna move in you ready for this super cute Ta-da! Hello team, I hope you enjoyed all that Claire had to offer there. Lots of tips and yeah, lots of uh, experiences we went through together, let's say that, in some of our joint races. Um, but yes, I am going to now talk to you about all things running and injury in relation to, obviously, high rocks for you guys. So let me share my screen. Beautiful. All right. So, are you going to play? She says, there we go. All right. So, firstly, just a little intro to myself so that you guys have a bit of an idea. Um, so, by trade, I was a running gait analyst or still am, um, have been involved in basically looking at how runners move for over 15 years, um, from my Saturday job as a 13, 14 year old to, yeah, all the way up to now. So yeah, it's my passion. It's what I love doing and doing it in order to help runners and all different types of athletes basically excel at whatever their sport is. Um, High Rocks athlete, as you can see from the photo. Um, lucky enough to have made world champs last year with Claire and also qualified for this year and just just love the race. It's one of my favourite things to do um, amongst multiple other things. So love me a 10K, a half marathon. I'm currently training for two marathons, which are a week apart. So um, yeah, I don't do things by half. So I quite enjoy a little bit of running here and there. Um, and then lastly, I am a strength conditioning coach, running coach, all things running orientated. So hopefully I can impart some, some wisdom on you guys to really help you tackling in your next High Rocks event. So before we get into all that information, let's talk about the I'm going to say the elephant in the room, but I feel like everyone is always like, what shoe should I be wearing, right? Every time I go to a high rocks or anytime I even put up a post about high rocks, people are like, so what shoes are you running in? And like, it's the one thing that people just aren't sure about. Okay. So this question, if I got a penny for every time I got this question, just generally in life, like even just for not even just high rocks, just everything, I would probably be a millionaire. Not even lying. What is the best shoe, Emma? Well, there's tons of them, right? And the thing with this is that there is not a best shoe in the market, right? As much as the marketeers want you to believe that their shoe is the best shoe, as much as you know the brands are going to tell you, yeah, we updated it with these cool updates and it's better than this person, they're better than that. I'm sorry to tell you it doesn't exist. But what I can tell you is that a correct shoe exists for you your foot shape, your foot function, and the task that is at hand. So obviously the task at hand is at High Rocks, right? When you think about High Rocks, High Rocks is basically a 10K race. Give or take, right? We're going in and out of the rock zones. We're, we're moving. We're kind of pushing things up and down. Overall, you're going to cover roughly about 10K. So you need that shoe to not only be comfortable, you need it to be fit for purpose in terms of 
the movements, the sleds, which is one of the key ones, which we'll touch on, um, and for all the other movements you're taking part in. So in terms of how a shoe should fit, I'm going to go over this first off. So you want to feel like someone's giving your foot a firm handshake. It's the best way I can describe it. So when you put your foot in a shoe, you want to kick back into the heel and you want to make sure you've got about a finger's width off the end of your longest toe. Okay. What that does is it gives your foot room to be able to splay. And what do I mean by splay? When we run and our foot makes contact with the ground, our foot arch relaxes. As it relaxes, the toes splay out to help shock absorb. And then they come back together, stiffen up to propel us forwards. If you're in a shoe that's too small, your feet aren't going to be able to splay. If they can't splay, then our foot and the muscles and the ligaments in there can't shock absorb or shock attenuate is what the word I'm looking for. Basically, that force is going to go somewhere else, be it your ankle, be it your knee, be it your calf, your hip. It's going to move somewhere further up the body. So if you are in a shoe that's too small, you don't actually know the problems that you could be causing yourself, right? So think about that in the simplest form, shoe size. Secondly, once you've got that shoe on, everyone, I think, especially on the sleds, has fear of their laces coming undone, right? I get it. Even I've been there when I've tied my laces the right way and I'm pushing it, especially the pro sled, and it's just not going anywhere. And I'm like, okay, my shoe might come off. Okay, have I tied it tight enough? One big thing, do not tie your shoelaces too tight. OK, you've got bundles of nerves that run down through the top of your foot. If you tie your lace too tight, some of you may have experienced it in training sessions or even in previous high rocks. Your feet can go numb. OK, so we try not to tie laces too tight. As I said, in a couple of slides time, I'm going to show you a video that you can get some heel locking on the laces as well as some pressure relief through the middle of the foot as well. So that would be my other tip. And then lastly, I kind of already touched on it in terms of size, but making sure your toes have space to wiggle around, right? Whatever shoe shape fits your foot, it could be you have a slightly wider foot, a slightly narrower foot. You need to make sure that whatever shoe you're in, you've got space for your toes to wiggle about. Then it means that that foot can act in the function it's meant to, to ultimately help you run, right? And keep you moving. So a bit further on footwear, when we are and find a kind of the right shape, so different brands across the globe, I don't know why I said the globe, but you know what I mean, across the, the running market, ultimately all they are, and they'll hate me saying this, is different shapes. So for example, New Balance, a little bit more rectangular in terms of shape. Asics, traditionally better for women because a little bit narrower in the heel, a little bit narrower in the middle of the foot and a bit more toe space. Mizuno, traditionally slightly wider in the forefoot, but nice and narrow in the heel. So all these brands have these kind of traditional shapes that they align to. Some of these brands have narrow fits, like Brooks, who also have a wide fit. And then you've got other brands that are just what I call like normal shape. So brands like Saucony and Under Armour and things like that. Once you've then found the shape that works for you, flip your shoe over, because this is where it comes into the sled. So as I've said here, ideally looking for rubber outsoles. Now, the difference here will be when you come up to more of those like carbon shoes that everybody loves because they spring you forwards and they make you look fast. And I love them too, don't get me wrong. But what you must do is try them on a sled that is at least 20 to 50 kilos heavier than you're going to push. If you are slipping about like no one's business in that shoe with that heavier weight, likely on that lovely coarse carpet that we all experience, you, you're probably going to slip on race day. So my biggest advice when you purchase a shoe, don't wear it outside, take it into the gym in the box, put it on and try and push your sled. If you're good, dream, right? If you have issues, that maybe tells you you need to switch out your shoe, all right? If it's not worn outside, the brand doesn't need to know. I didn't tell you that, okay? But like that's what I would say from someone coming with, with that experience and being like, I'm unsure if it's going to work. Give that a whirl, all right? Also, as you've seen, I've put here a lot of people that I've seen recently in many hierarchies, because I'm that gal that when we finish a race, I watch what people's shoes are and, and how they're doing, is I've seen a lot of trail shoes. And what's good with the trail shoes is they have built in sticky style grip, right? You think about trail, it's running on rocks, sand, uneven surfaces. So people wearing trail shoes will actually naturally have a bit more of a stickier grip on the sole of the shoe. So as I said, if you found a brand that works for your foot shape, Take a look at some of their trail shoes. See what the sole's like. Is it grippier? Has it got some extra rubber divots and holes in that you could use that could definitely benefit you on race day? Granted, 
on the surface we run in high rocks, it might be a little bit firmer. But ultimately, in terms of grip on the foot, it's definitely going to benefit you there. So definitely some things there for you to consider from a footwear perspective. Um, I've kind of haven't really touched on that idea of pronation and supination. But just so you know, everyone are maybe 0.5 of a percent pronates. OK, pronation is the simple movement of my foot coming to the ground, landing on the outside, which, again, is very normal. Where on the outside of the heel coming down, that movement there is pronation. For some of us, we continue that inward rotation or pronatory movement, as it's called, to different degrees. Do we want to stop it? Not always. All right. Your body is doing it for a reason. My issue with pronation is if people are doing it too quickly. So if that foot's snapping in and moving really fast as it's going through the foot strike. The biggest thing that I would say is if that is you, strengthen up your calves, work on the little muscles in your feet, and that will help with that pronatory movement and slowing it down. Does that mean I don't want you in support shoe? Absolutely not. Some of you might need that support shoe, but just bear it in mind that not everyone needs to go into that big support shoe if they pronate. All right. Beautiful. So here are some videos on lacing. Now, I believe this is going to get sent out, obviously, with the recording. So you can click on this and see it in detail. But ultimately, this is a long video of me showing you how to lace. So this is the heel lock lacing. As you can see, I make two little bows either side of the shoe. Once that's then done, the lace goes into each little bow that's created. And then thereafter, you kind of tighten it with a little seesaw side to side, and that will lock in your heel, ultimately. So as it says in the thing, you may feel pressure on the instep if you do it too tight, so loosen that off, all right? And then if we come into the second video, some also jazzy music, this is for instep pressure. So this is where I was talking about sometimes people feeling numbness on the foot. And you can see what I do is I completely unlace the shoe. I'm going to skip it up a little bit. From unlacing the shoe, I will then just relace it, creating a little space at the top of the foot. So by creating that space, you relieve the pressure point that's pushing on the top of those bundle of nerves that sit through the top of that arch. This has been great for Claire. It's made a massive difference for her. She has a very high arch. So anyone out there with high arch feet, this is a great one for you to do with your laces. And what's also great is once you've then made the laces a little bit longer by skipping that little gap, you can actually then do the heel lock lace. So you can double whammy it. You can relieve the pressure on the top of the foot and then you can add in that heel lock lace there as well. All right. So yeah, I'll make sure either Claire sends the link to you in the emails after this, um, or obviously you'll get this recording so you can have a look at them there. But I wanted to make sure you had those two. All right. Cheeky little secrets to help your feet. OK, don't know why that image is there, but it's a big thing about what I'm going to talk about. I think Jay's probably going to touch on it as well tonight. But ultimately, High Rocks is a running event. I don't care what anyone says. Yes, it's functional fitness, but you're running for pretty much most of it. There's only the few couple of minutes here and there at the stations when you're not running. Right. So you need to improve your running. OK, zone two is the most magical place where gains are made. I don't know how to say it much simpler. What is zone two, Emma? I've never heard of that before. Zone two is based off of your heart rate. So there is a traditional way to work out your heart rate, which is kind of a bit backdated now. It's like 220 minus your age. There is a new updated method that has literally disappeared out of my brain. But the formula, again, oh, oh what's it called? I can't remember what it is, but basically there's a different formula. And I wish my brain would remember it now, but ultimately, you can find out your maximal heart rate. For those of you with heart rate monitors or even watches, watches can be about 10% out, just so you know. But roughly, you'll be able to get an idea of what your maximal heart rate is. You then will have percentage zones. And your zone two is going to roughly sit, for most people, between 60 and 70% of your maximal heart rate. Okay? Basically, simple, easy movement. Now, one thing that I've learned, especially as a coach, is... For a lot of people, they don't do work in this zone. A lot of people are so used to doing these big hit classes, these big like smashing conditioning and staying in the red zone and seeing that as like the biggest trophy to you know, I was in red the whole time. I burnt the most calories. That's cool for 10% of your training, right? When you're training for an event, when you're training to build your body's capacity to run fast, you need this zone too. In terms of a little bit of science behind that, 
your body's basically builds up lactics. You know that heavy feeling in your legs when you're like, oh, I can't keep moving. That sucks. Zone two, you build up your body's aerobic ability. And the bigger your aerobic base sees it as kind of like a, a pyramid. The bigger your bottom base, the more you're able to run at this top end level. So ultimately, if you can build that base, we're talking, you know, super long efforts for cruisy, comfy pace, chatty, talky pace on a run, on a cycle, on a row. Doing that continually will ultimately then allow your heart rate to adapt to being in that zone. And thus, then when you run at zone five and push it up here, you can hold that harder pace for longer. Okay, I'm going to try and make that hopefully that simple. Zone two makes you be able to work at a higher capacity because your body can buffer the lactic that builds up because of the bigger base of aerobic fitness. I'm trying to keep it really simple and not say too many like massively sciencey words. So hopefully that makes sense. Lastly, on the running. So obviously with high rocks, there's a lot of big things on the floor. People talk about the sleds a lot. People talk about, you know, the burpees taking the wind out of you. That's what it does for me anyway. Um, the rowing as well, the fatigue on the legs, the lunges. But the key thing, obviously, we do strength for. We do our squats, we do our deadlifts, we do our lunges, all that stuff. One of the biggest things actually going to be your superpower in high rocks is doing your little things, right? The little things that I give runners for marathon training, right? That are going to go and conquer 20 odd miles. And these things are these three specifics. So first one, a golden oldie, Copenhagen plank. You may or may not have seen this in the video that I'm going to play. You'll see I'm doing a shortened version. So what this does is this strengthens up through the adductors. So it's those muscles that actually is a side, it's not side hustle, that's not the word I'm looking for, but stay with me, are going to look after stabilizing your pelvis, right? We always talk about glutes as being the big drivers for stabilizing your hips. Actually, the little muscles, when the glutes aren't working as well, they're going to be super important. This Copenhagen plank is going to help strengthen them. So you're looking to start, it sounds quite simple when we're used to holding planks for, you know, a lot longer than this. But trust me, when you're in this setup and in this position, 20 seconds can be really difficult. So if you need to take it down to 15 or 10, then do so. But you're looking two to three sets each side, quality over quantity, all right? Second one, you can see I've got a little ball between my ankles there. Reason being, I want to use my big toes as much as possible, okay? Your big toes are a massive driver to help you propel out the ground when you run. Lots of people don't use them. So double, obviously, we're using that ball between the ankles, is really gonna get you working through those big toes and i've put here 20 to 40 reps and i'm being serious it's not a typo you're looking to do big sets of calf raises the stronger your calves are the more you can propel out the ground all right that's that's massive for you from a running perspective it means as well you know when you get to that sled and you see people's calves cramping up you're going to have strong calves you're going to be able to drive using those calves as well as all those other parts of the body that we nurture and then the last one is a psoas march so basically your hip flexors. Everyone always says, oh, I've got really tight hip flexors from sitting all day. Granted, that's probably true. But many of you probably don't have strong hip flexors. No, very rarely do I ever hear physios going, oh, you've got a tight hip flexor, let's strengthen it. They always tell you to stretch it. As much as that's good, it's still not going to strengthen the issue. So these psoas marches I put in the bottom, very, very simple, banded, pushing back, holding for a couple of seconds and switching over, looking for 10 to 15 reps each side. All right, so I didn't know that was gonna play now, so you can see. Holding in that position, trying to bring that bottom leg up as high as possible. For me there, I'm only holding it for about 20 seconds and it's a struggle. I've been building that time over time. For me, it used to be a struggle for 10 seconds, genuinely. So I've dropped down to the kneeling version. You can then also progress it by doing it just where your feet are on that box and you're stretching out in terms of through into the next movement oh it's gone straight down to the bottom great so this is the psoas march so you can see i'm lying on my back i'm pulling my feet in towards my chest holding for a couple of seconds before i push back now i'm putting my feet under my hands it's very core intensive so you really want to tuck your pelvis under you can hold on to something behind you if you haven't got that core strength so that is another one that you can really really add in and then no, oh, there's no video there. It's just a picture. That's not ideal. But hey, calf raises. I guess you guys know what a calf raise is, right? All the way up on the toes, all the way down. You can progress this by going single legs, obviously without the ball. 
And the dream world, you want to be able to do 20, 30, even 40 reps on each leg individually. I won't even lie, I'm up to about 20 each leg right now. So I'm getting there. But like, it's one that is a constant builder, right? And if you don't use it, you lose it, as I've learned. So that's a really big one you can add in. Another side one, just to chuck in there at the very end, is skipping. If any of you like skipping or have a background in doing like boxing style stuff, skipping is great for those calves. It's basically like constant plyometrics and calf raises. So if you like skipping, maybe do that before you do an interval session or do that before you do a conditioning session, just as your warm up, just to get those calves switched on and awoken. So as you saw, team, these are all the key ones that I would swear by. There are probably at least seven more that I would say are, are great for you to add in. But I think for me, if you haven't got those three in, you're not going to be bulletproof in your body for what Hyrox has for you. So ideally, these are just to help you not get injured through your training journey because we all want to get to the race start. And that's the fun. Right. So make sure you do all these little nitty gritty bits as well as the main strength and everything else. But if you can't do all of that, nail these to really help support your running. All right, there was a um, there was a, a question that came in there about your bottom leg. Um, I just think while you've got that photo up, it might be worth um, answering that. Is what what's your bottom leg doing on that Copenhagen plank? Is it resting on the floor? Or are you holding it up? I, I don't know who asked that, but it's uh, while you've got the photo, you might as well. Yeah, nice one, Jay. Thanks for jumping there. Yeah, so that bottom leg is basically trying to pull towards where my top leg is. So the bottom leg is on the bench, and I'm trying to pull my knee as close towards that top knee as possible. To progress it, what you can also do is fully extend out that bottom leg to make it a little bit harder. So in this one, I've kept it tight, but yeah, that knee, you wanna keep it as close to the other knee as possible. And that's really where you'll feel those adductors switching on. What I would say as well, just as a heads up in case people feel it, because it's what I felt in the first few weeks of doing it. If you feel like a sharp, sharp pain in your adductor, it sounds weird, but it's just it switching on. So it can, because those muscles are so small and they're very micro that you're working, it can feel very sharp and isolating. So if it kind of catches you by surprise, you probably hit the right muscle. All right. Which is why, as I said at the start, five to 10 seconds is, is the amount I would suggest doing it. And then just building week on week. I'm going to have a look. I think there's a few more questions. Cheers for picking that up, Jay. Um, it's going to go for all the videos. There we go. Um, how many times a week should we be doing it? Yeah. So with your accessory work, as you can see from pretty much all of those, granted, I was in a gym there, but you can do that from home on like a poof or a sofa or something like that. You're looking at trying to do that at least three or four times a week, just doing the little stuff. Do you know, if you can put aside 10 minutes, you saw how much work that was. It's not a huge amount. You know, if while your dinner's cooking or, you know, I'm trying to think of something else random in the house, but like while something else is happening, build it into your routine. Like a classic one, anyone who has stairs in their house, every time you walk up your stairs at the top of your staircase, do a set of 20 calf raises. Like things like that, so you can just build it in on a day-to-day -day basis should really, really help. Let's see if I've got any more of these. Best upper body for sled pull, single arm rows for me would be the one for that. So whether it's in a standing position and just using the cable, pulling back, if you've got only bands or stuff like that at home, literally attaching the band, just focusing on single side, 15 to 20 reps. Because again, we want that endurance. Same on the other side. To progress it, you can do it in say like a TRX position. So if you're lying down, feet down, arms up on a TRX, you can just pull in with one side, add a bit of progression in there to add it and make it a little bit more difficult. Um, and then classically, your renegade rows, your plank position, rowing into hip, coming back down. That's a real nice, simple way, keeping those hips stable, that you're really going to be able to add in some extra pull work for your sled pull. Ultimately, obviously, trying that sled pull is going to make a massive difference, right? And really getting to grips with how to use your form and body with it. But Ultimately, for me, yeah, doing those little accessories will really, really massively help. Um, the only one, the only one I would add on to that um, would be a classic pull up. It, like, there's, exactly. there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with the basics. Um, Absolutely, pull ups are hard, so don't get me wrong. If you ain't got pull ups, get yourself a band out, do negatives. There's usually an assisted machine in most gyms now where you can take some of your own body weight out of the out of the motion, but exactly. build, build them up as well now. You know, if you can pull your own body weight, it's going to really help you pull that pull that sled. And but accessory wise, 
you know, your pens over row and your single leg, single arms are fantastic. You can't get much better. Um, and I do think there's one more trainer question for you there, Emma. There is. Let's have a look. Where are we? Do you recommend wearing different trains for running trains than using the gym? Great question. And I would say in terms of your depending on where you are in your phase of like, I'm going to get a bit technical here, but depending on where your phase are in your training, I would say to start with, yes, most definitely. So, you know, if you have a very much strength bias day where you're going to be doing, your, your, as we were talking about very much at the start, your heavy squats, your deadlifts, all that kind of stuff, definitely having a flat shoe. Being really basic, your things like your Converse, your Vans, they're great. Your foot's close to the ground. You've got space for your toes to splay. We don't want a big like trainer to do things like that because you really want your body to be in contact kind of with the ground and feeling the movements. As you then transition towards kind of, you know, those last eight to six weeks where you're going to be doing probably more high rocks compromised sessions with the runs in and things like that, then you want to start building in that trainer that you're going to use on race day. So that is likely going to be a trainer. So, you know, if you're doing your 500 meter run on the treadmill then you're coming in and doing sled work and then you're going back up and then you're coming back down you're doing your squats or whatever your your kind of coach is programmed definitely do that with the training you're going to use on race day but in the beginning 100 i'd say get a training shoe and a running shoe and then just use them alternately at the start is there any more my favorite trainers. Oh, see, there isn't technically a favorite because you guys are going to be different to me, but I do have a favorite. So my favorite one is actually the sole of the shoe that I showed in that image. Let me see if I can go back. So the one on the right hand side is the Hover Machina. And that was the last shoe that we actually did doubles in and I ran in it. It was a very last minute decision. I won't lie. I'd done a couple of training sessions in it. Um, but the grip on the sole was unreal. When I was pushing that sled, I felt super stable, didn't feel any motion coming from underneath it. Um, and yeah, the cushioning was great. It is a slightly heavier shoe than I'd normally use. The other shoe I use is the Flow from Under Armour, um, really nice and light. And the sole is actually pretty good on there too. So, but I, if I had to say one that was better, I genuinely think that Machina is, is better than the Flow. So yeah, that would be my shoe that I really prefer for it. But again, there's so many really great options out there and it's just making sure you have that rubber sole or you even look at that trail option. Um, and as I say, do the sneaky thing where you purchase it and then don't wear it until you try in the gym. <laughs> Is that everything? What would you recommend doing a week before the race? Do you know what? I'm going to wait for that question and I'm going to leave it for Jay to answer so that, got that one covered that's, you got that one covered yeah that's, just that's so that i don't end up talking forever <laughs> but guys honestly if there are any other like trainer related questions obviously and um, one thing i didn't put at the end was like any of my details but yeah by all means dm me on instagram anything like that um reach out get in touch and yeah i'm excited for next hyrox races get my marathon out of the way and then um yeah i'll see you all right guys so thanks for both of the guys so far that like some really invaluable information there. I hope you've got some notes I know we're going to get the sends out but like there's been some great information coming across there so firstly I'm just going to touch on some of the things that have been said from my perspective um we've mentioned simulations I completely agree you don't need to be hammering simulations every couple of weeks every so often like but I'm not against them I think one one beforehand is not a bad idea, but I agree to the point of like a 75% effort, bring that intensity down a little bit, but to get a feel for it. And the reason I say that is partially due to the, um, the mental side of it of practicing your standards, practicing your strategy and practicing, you know, wh where you're going to take that breath, where you're going to take that break. We're talking about people getting to the end of the wall balls and falling apart. Like, a lot of people will go in and they've done war balls and practice and they've done, you know, sets of 20. It's, unless you've done it, it's so likely you're going to be doing sets of 20. And then once you do a 20, you might, your arm's going to fall apart and you're going to realise that this is a lot harder than it was in the gym when you were just doing a workout per se. So I would, I wouldn't, I'm not against the simulation to try and build that in and try and to understand and try and get that plan in place so that you know if you have to do fives, great. 
start with doing tens, go down to fives if you need to, and doing singles when you're in that, you know, that, that back end of the race, it's fine. You just got to know that it's coming and it doesn't matter if you have to break it down. If you start getting no reps, don't worry about it. Put, put the ball down, take a second, count to three, go again. Like, don't let it throw you because it does happen. And I've seen some of the best athletes. I've seen guys who are breaking 70 minutes get there and end up doing singles, single war balls, one at a time, dropping the ball every time. Legs go. It's it's tough. It is a really tough race. So, you know, go through it, work out. Are you going to do it in sets of five, do it in sets of 10? Are you going to step on every lunge? Are you going to step through on every lunge? Um, how, where are you going to take that break? Um have a good run through, like I say, ease off the pressure a little bit. Don't go flat out because, um, as we've said, the central nervous system is going to it's going to trash you, and you're going to lose some some training time. You exactly get more benefits out of the volume. Uh, but I, I'm not against it. But definitely, you don't need to be doing them every week or every couple of weeks. Even um, enjoy the first one. If your if your first one coming up is London, get it as a baseline. Go enjoy it. Take the pressure off. See how you get on. Come back. You've got something to beat. You'll work out. And that's one of my, my first points, really, is identifying your weaknesses. That's got to be one of the biggest things you can do. Now, if this is, I'm going to look at this from more perspective of getting ready for the world champs, um, but you can take any of this information and apply it to um, races moving forward. So when Hyrox is fantastic as a company, they give you the opportunity to be able to go, right, I've done a race. There's a breakdown at every single station. You can walk away from that and go, I, well, I've, I really nailed out on this. So I take it all off their website, put it into a spreadsheet, and then start going, okay, so there's Madrid, there's New York, there's London. And I look at all of them across it and go, okay, what happened? Like, where's the progression? What was my weakness? And start identifying what went wrong, um, what could be improved. And how it also tells you how you got on compared to everyone else, which it just really, you might think, I'm great at it, he's really good at them. Well, actually, you were three hundredth. I mean, that's not actually that bad. But you know, maybe you were first on the sled push. You're thinking, actually, I'm a bit of a beast on the sled push. It it gives you an indication of what you then go and program. Like your return on investment, your time spent on a ski egg. You're gonna save yourself. You could ski every single day and absolutely hammer it. But it's one k, and a fast skier might break four minutes. A steady skier, maybe like 4.10, and a slow skier might be like closer to five. It's like we're not losing that much time, but a, like 50% of this race is running. If you go out and run, you can pull those 10, 20, 30 seconds back every kilometer. So where you're spending your time building this program, um, when you're building a, a, a program for you to be able to um, go to your next race, I would really take those splits and put them into a spreadsheet and start analyzing. And then if you do do a simulation, you can put them splits in too, especially if it's your first one, compare it to your, to your, to your simulation and kind of start seeing what was the difference? What went wrong? What do I need to work on? Because you will start identifying things like, is this a strength problem? Is this an endurance problem? Is this a capacity problem? Because it could turn out that actually you're great on the sled, so it's not a strength problem. You don't need to be spending three, se three sessions a week hammering heavy squats, deadlifts, but your running was, maybe you come from a bit more of a CrossFit background, you've got that strength, but your running wasn't quite in line with your, your hope, uh, where you'd like to be in terms of overall positioning. So where are we spending most of our time? It's got to be running. But if it's, you know, if you're running, you've got great splits, but your lunges at the end are falling apart and you're like 600th person in the, in the lunges, that might not be a strength element. It might be more of a conditioning element. So your training will change again and you'll be focused on getting that level of strength endurance up and that's not about hitting those three to five reps on heavy squats it's about getting that you know reverse lunges in with a slightly heavier bar so you build up to it but getting that capacity work in, and then as soon as you finish it drop setting it going into the next level so it's it's about building that capacity to be able to flush out the legs um at those at those weights just a really important thing to kind of know what you're doing when you're building a program if you've got so you can do it in a simulation. You can go look at somebody else's results. If you haven't done one, go and look at anyone's results. Like just go and find somebody in your age group, your age category, scroll in the middle, find out the results, do a simulation and go, how do I sit? Where 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 am I? What am I what am I missing here if I want to start pushing up the leaderboard a little bit and getting getting further down the road? So 
I would highly recommend that's probably the most important thing that you can do to make sure that your training is very specific to what you need because there's a big thing that you could see someone you can see any of us on instagram doing a fantastic session but it's like it's like one piece of the puzzle right it's not it's not the whole picture um you need to identify what you need and how that fits into a bigger program so and how it's structured and how it builds further on so yeah deep dive um on those weaknesses and try and work out what's missing and that will also include things like is it your compromised running so that's a big part of irox it's I'm not a bad runner, but when I come off a when I come off a sled, it's a slightly different story. Um, so building those, building that capacity up to be able to do that is something that you kind of need to work out. And and your heart rate is sky high, and you're working in that maximal zone. Um, it becomes a different story. So working at that is important. But there's something massive to be said about as we spoke about earlier. What Emma said. Um, the level two zone now that is where majority of my training will take place if you go and hammer like we talk about um, working out your maximum heart rate now the easy option for that is something like my zone if you get a heart rate monitor that can turn around and go your maximum you have to wear it for a couple of weeks but after a couple of weeks it'll go your heart maximum heart rate is roughly around here it's going to be pretty close now if you have all your colors you'll be able to tell i'm like all my level two stuff is i'm High blue, low green, nice visual for you to be able to look at and go, that's where I need to be training majority of the time. If I get into this green zone or this low yellow zone and I'm in there a lot of the time, I'm not racing there and I'm not getting any recovery there. So I then go and do a hit session and I'm not able to really give it 100%. I'm not able to you know, max output on those you know 1K efforts or the 400 efforts because even though it wasn't that hard, I was in that green and yellowy zone, like at the bottom end of the yellow, and you're not racing there. You're just tired. So it's trying to work out what side of the uh, what side of your training you're at. If it's if it's easy, it needs to be easy. Like I can say I'm I'm not a bad runner, but if I see a hill and I'm meant to be in zone two, I'll walk up the hill. Like it's it's okay to do that. Like it's it's knowing that it's being disciplined enough to be able to do that. Like we can all go for a run together. You guys all might run up the hill. And if you guys go into the high green, low yellow, and I stay in my blue, I don't care. This isn't a race. This is all I've gone for a level two run. Like, do your own thing. Great to get out with people, but, you know, make sure you're being disciplined to what you need because they're not going to be there on the day. So work out your zones. I really recommend working off something like heart rate. It's it's so much. It, there's a lot of accuracy to it. And you can have it on the day. You can have it on. You can look at it in your watch or whatever it may be. But are you at level two or are we high yellow, high red? There's kind of a little bit in between. It's You're not racing there. You're not training there. How many zones, zone two sessions do you do each week? Um, I'll answer that as we go. So I would say you're looking at about three sessions. And that is, you know, I would get a long base run in on mine, potentially two long base runs. And generally, I like to get like a ski or a row at a long, at a level two as well. It's... I'll definitely get the long run and the long um, row or skiing on uh, zone two. Everything else kind of fits in around it. But you can also get like movement patterns where you're practicing things like lunges, wall balls, and you're doing these movements and you're not going for time. You're not absolutely smashing it. You're just practicing hitting depth. Where am I stepping? Like you can do the other movements. It's quite hard to do babies, or at least for me in zone two. I can't, um, yeah, that's that's a tricky one. But you can practice the, the movements. You can actually get them. So you can still get in and, and move. But I would be in for two or three, especially depending where you're at. If you're going to Worlds and you're a little bit further along on the journey, two's fine. But if you're starting out and you're still setting, trying to set a baseline, just still trying to work out if you've got the engine to complete a high rocks, I would definitely be going for three. Like, most important thing is completion. So there's no point hammering 10 times 400 meters if you're not sure you've got an hour and a half worth of cardio in you. Because at the end of the day, it's an hour and a half race. You need to be able to, for me, um, Claire mentioned earlier being able to run a 10K. My guys, I get them to run 10 miles. Like most of you are going to be out there for that long. Like you might not run that far, but time wise, like 
an hour to an hour and a half time, but time wise is generally a good duration, um, good way to work at frequency. I would be looking at time. Like if you know this race is going to take you about an hour and a half, you kind of need to be able to run for an hour and a half. Zone two, be able to talk, be able to chat away, breathe all the way, nice and comfortable, walk up the hill, but you need to be able to do that. So that is the starting point. If you're looking more towards the world and you're really trying to turn that screw a little bit, two is great. Get two a weekend. Even on the bike, I do one on the bike sometimes, mix it up. It's just easier. Um, take the pressure off the joints instead of doing all the hard one. And then mix it up with some more intense work. But like I say, your hard is hard and your easy is easy. It's okay. I think you need to be doing um, six to seven sessions a week um, at that kind of front end of the race. I don't think you need to be doing much more than that. Um, and that's moving into my um, into my next point. So we are about 10 weeks out from the World Champs, which is crazy. That's kind of flew around. Um, so my next idea on that is periodization. So it's making a plan. And I've talked about identifying the weaknesses and then it's how about you structure that. So I like to periodize by training blocks for my clients um, and that is, and for myself, and that is getting a block of, um, four weeks roughly so and then gradually building it up and you can change the intensity and the volume and you can work that on a simple simple method if you're building this for yourself by going okay week one i'm going to do seven hours of training two long sessions level two and build the other sessions in around that make sure they're your staple get one hard tempo session in on the run maybe a speed session and then build in your weaknesses around that Great. Week two, week three, week four, every week, we're adding an hour. We're adding an hour of training. And then week five, we go back to roughly six hours. We drop it a week. That week is recovery. No one likes it. No one likes to take a little bit of time off. I don't like it either. But it's actually really important because when we're training, we're just tearing the muscle. So we take that week, we still do six hours. Like I still I still like to get something in. They will be the base runs and the, the slow, steady bike rides and things like that. They're key still to get in, but I pull that back a bit. The intensity is still there. They're just shorter weeks. They're just shorter sessions. So I might take a 45 minutes down to 30 minutes um, and just get something in so I still feel like I'm I'm moving. But pull it back, recover for a week and start the process again. So that's five weeks. We've still got another five weeks until Worlds. So every week from this week, we're doing seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours, week five, six hours. And then we're going to start at eight hours. We're going to gradually move that token a little bit back up. So where we started on week two, that's where we're going to start on week one for our second block. And we're going to progress again. By the time we get to the week before, we're now one week out from High Rocks World Champs. This is taper time. This is back to a deload, similar kind of um, style. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's, it's pushing, getting understanding that periodization to be able to increase. So we're not just increasing volume. We are also going to increase intensity. It's about having that structure. Now intensity can come down to simple things like, okay, week one, I'm squatting and I'm going to move it. I'm going to add a couple of kilograms. I'm, we're not talking... Like every week we're expecting to add it. Some weeks you won't move. Like some weeks you will keep the same um, weight on the bar and it's just, you're not ready to move yet. Week three, week four, we might find we're adding two or three kilograms on strength. Strength is the zone I'm in right now, trying to develop that. And it's like, it takes time. It's slow. But we gradually move it bit by bit and get to the next, get to the next point. And then we bring it back down for that deload. So we start, reset and go again. Um, Looking at that, that's quite important when we start talking about things like the world champs, because a lot of you will have, or potentially will have qualified via the open. If you're then going to go to worlds, you might get a shock when you realize you're doing pro weights, which is a uh, is kind of terrifying. If you're qualified via the open and you get there, and now you're being told you you've got to race at the at the higher end of that, it's really something that you have to take into consideration when you're building that and working out your weaknesses. Because a weakness might be, and you don't realize it, that those sleds are heavy. Um, so really start, but be careful on them because increasing weights too quick is, is a disaster for anyone. Um, so I would recommend those strong compound lifts of 
deadlifts, um, squats, and you don't need loads of time on the sled, but you know, practice it, get on it, get on a sled, and, and there is always a difference. Like I work off a, an RP scale, so a rate of perceived exertion. The high rocks sleds always feel like an eight or a nine. They're hard. They're just hard. Um, so that one seven five plus sled, uh, I think it's roughly just over two hundred kilograms is the total weight uh, for the men's pro. If I put two hundred kilograms on my sled in my gym, it's it's like the carpet's different, the surface is different, the uh, the sled itself is different. It feels like it's moving on ice. Like I can load my sled up to four or five hundred kilograms, and I look like the man. Uh, it's really like I'm I'm flying. Look at all this weight on the thing. But that feels like high rocks weight for me. Like when by the time because the sled's different. So work off an RPE. It's the best thing I can say when you're training. Don't worry about what it's like. Your sled might be terrible. You might put like 60 kilograms on it. I've got another sled down the road that you just wants to tip over when you got like 40 kilograms on it. So be sensible. Don't worry too much about the weight of the sled. It's gonna feel different on the day. So work off an RPE. Know that it's gonna feel hard and train knowing it's hard and progressively overload it, progressively add a little bit more weight. But it's a strength element. You can really build up those weights on your reverse lunges. You can build up those weights on split squats. You can build up that weight on squats, deadlifts. You can build them plyometric works or big explosive movements, big uh, box jumps, uh, baby box jumps. These kind of movements are the things that are going to help you shift that weight when you come to it and also give you the endurance to be able to um, get those lunges and wall balls later on in the race. So things to think about, definitely something to think about if you are jumping from open to pro, and that may just be because you've qualified for the Worlds. So be aware of it, know that it's coming, um, practice at those weights because it's going to be a shock. 30 kilograms on a sandbag, you can't put it down. It's You've got to practice it and you've got to know it's coming and you've got to be ready for it. But don't forget, 50% of this race is a running race. Spend time on your feet. Get used to it. Um, yeah, I've touched on, I want to touch on the confusion in this gray area. We've done that. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention, it's the world champs itself, as we're looking at that, is it's a race. It's not a place that I would say is somewhere to go to look for your time. It is, it's the world champs. It doesn't matter. And I'll be honest, I've raced it this year. I've raced um, Manchester course this year. It wasn't particularly quick as a course. Now, that sounds strange because it's standardised, but sometimes because of the way the layout is and the thing that you get a shorter rock zone, you get a, a wider track, um, you get like more turns on a, on a farmer's carry and all these little simple things add up and it, it makes it a slightly different dynamic. Um, it is the correct race as in like it is standardized it is a nine it's, well, it's actually about nine kilometers when you do all the stations um i've got a foot pod on on when i race and it tells me exactly how far i've moved across the whole race and every race i've done it's been within 0.1 of a of a kilometer um and that's berlin new york madrid london birmingham they're always come up the same like they're always within nine to 9.1 and let's be honest that 9.1 could be me um just taking a little bit wider of a turn or whatnot. So the races are there, but that does still mean that Manchester was a slow course. For example, for whatever reason, wider track, more turns on the lunges, more turns on the farmer's carry. It's not, and it's the wealth. It's just time to go and race. Work out what your age group is. Work out what, how you're going to finish. Go enjoy it and just be conscious of it. And that's a great thing to know going in because if you go in and you come in and you look at your watch and it says, 4.30 on the on the first kilometers and you come and you're expecting to run a four. That's mentally really difficult to deal with. And there will be people who are caught out by that because every race they've done this season, they've run four for that first K. And then you see 4.30, you think today's not my day. And instantly you start thinking, ah, the day's over. It's over. And that mental toughness is. Okay, you just got to be prepared for that. And in the world, that's going to happen, I think, to a lot of people this year. So be aware of the fact that it's not particularly fast. It's a race. We're not worried about the time called Manchester. We're there to see how we can get on. Um, and that might not be applicable to you because you might not be going to Wales. Um, but if you are or you've got ambition to get there, I think even Vegas last year was really exciting because 
we were all in the same age group and started together. Um, so everyone in my age all started on the line at the same time and we all went off. And as it was mentioned earlier, quite a few people went off a little bit too quick. So even at world champs level, people still do it. Like people went out around like a three minute kilometer. Not many people come on a three minute kilometer and he definitely can't hold it. So adrenaline kicks in, nerves kick in, the excitement of it all gets, and like I say, and generally one person does it. So about three more go with them thinking they're racing. Sit at the back, sit in the middle, let them go. It's a long race. You can you can beat me by 30 seconds on that first one, 40 seconds on that first one. But if you are in that red zone and you spike up to that heart rate of like max effort, by the time you can't really get it back down because there's no space to get it back down and higher up. You're working at max level for an hour, an hour and a half. There's no real time for it to come back down. So you're just going to gas out. You're just not going to make it. So be careful going out. Like I always say the race starts at the burpees. You could be at that 80% until the burpees. Honestly, you're not you're not going to lose any time on it. Like you will you will benefit more from stop starting to overtake people. It's quite a nice feeling um, to be able to like come back into a race and then you see people who have just gone out too quick and their legs have fell off. So first one or 20th one. It happens across every race. People go out too hard. Know yourself, know your pace. And it always feels easy at first because you've got a lot of adrenaline. So just take it easy. Um, but enjoy the enjoy the world. That's the that's the um, the, the main events. That's kind of what we train for all year. And you know, if you get there next year as well, it's it's the focus. So you've got to go into it and make sure you've got it right. Um, I talked about the last so we've got 10 weeks. The 10th week is our taper week. And tapering is for any event from um, first or tenth, like we said. Um, if you don't do it right, you'll stick out on that start line, or you'll get, you know, off the ski, and you'll feel like a bit of a slug. Like, and that's the only way I can describe it. Really, you're just not quite there, and you've probably got the taper wrong. Um, you may have got the nutrition wrong. You may just be having a bad day. But realistically, if you get the taper wrong, um, you're going to have problems. And um, I've seen this. In many different ways, there's the obvious way is just training as normal and just having a normal week's training and then coming into it and not quite having the energy. Another way is, and I tested this a lot when I was doing triathlon, it was um, I would take, so our races were always on a Sunday, I would take the Saturday off, train on the Friday, take the Saturday off, race on the Sunday. But I'd always found it took me 15 minutes to get into the race because I just needed to get the body moving again after a day off um, because we train most days, so we're used to it. So I found what works better for me is taking the in um, high rocks, I take the um, Thursday off, run for 20 minutes just to get the legs moving again. Super easy. The activation run, my clients laugh at me because they always get that in the program. Uh, 20 minutes on the, on the Friday just to get the legs moving. And then Saturday, you're primed, you're ready to move, you've done something, the legs are no longer stiff, seized up, no longer, you know, you've got going again. Uh, I think that's really important. Best way to work that out of what version, if that works for you, is a simulation, is a tough session. You said one or two of them is not the worst, worst thing to do. If you've only got four weeks left before something like London, do one this weekend and don't do another one, definitely. Or like if you've got Wales or you've got a, something in the future coming up, try one or two, see where you're at. Like say 75% max effort, but just see if you feel sluggish off a day, rest before, and how what works best for you. Take a gel with you, try it out. Where are you going to take it? You're going to take it off. You're going to take it while you've just finished babies and your like stomachs all over the place. Probably not. Are you going to take it after the roll when you've just been sat down for four minutes? Maybe. Um Try these things out and just kind of have a feel for it and see what works for your stomach, see what works for you on the day. Um, but have a little play around with that taper. For me, the most important thing is like the deload week in week five is you keep the intensity very similar, but you drop the volume right down. So if I would do every Wednesday four times a K, this week on Wednesday, I'm doing two times a K. I'm just dropping the volume down, but my intensity is staying there because I want to feel sharp I want to still feel good. I want to get to Thursday and kind of be thinking, I just want to race. Instead of like, I'll be all right on Saturday. 
like I've just got to flush these legs out a bit. You kind of want to be chomping at the bit. You kind of want to be ready to go and push and have another go. So that's works by generally reducing your volume but keeping the intensity somewhere in the same region as normal. Um, I'm conscious that I'm meant to finish in one minute and I will talk about this all day. Um, I will quickly just tell you something, that, something non-related to High Rocks, but I, quite a few years back now, um, was a part of a team that went over to Russia with one of my friends. And this is about like visualization of being immensely tough. And one of the guys was racing across Russia on a bike. So we had to go from Moscow to Vladivostok, which is 9,000 kilometers on a bike. Now, it's just stupid. And you got 21 days to do it. And it was all stage races. So some of these stages were like three, three and a half thousand kilometers. And the only time the clock stops during these stages were when you finished it. So if you wanted to stop and just get off the bike, the clock still ran. It was a race during this time. And this is this is like extremes, extremes of racing. But the whole time. We were in the little car next to him in a van, and we were trying to, I was there to try and help him with nutrition. Now, no form of nutrition at this point can keep someone going. You can't consume enough calories. Like there was no form of like it's freezing cold. It's it's, it's been the amount of pressure, the amount of times that guy must have wanted to get off that bike must have been unbelievable to keep churning. I don't know what must have been going through his head when the times that got that tough. And like I say, we're talking about extremes, but we're trying to do an hour and a half race and there's got to be those same moments of where we get into it and go, I just want to stop. Like, or there's going to be times where you've got training sessions that you kind of need to do and you got, like, it's going to be cold on time, it's going to be wet, it's going to be a bit crap and we're all kind of not going to want to do it. Um, but there's those, I always look back at that and think, this guy's cycled across the country and he kept getting on the bike and kept getting back on it and, and it was two in the morning. There was one moment where it was about two, three in the morning. I'm in the middle of nowhere in Russia and he's swerving on the road a little bit and we pull him off. We say he's got to get off and he's got to take a nap. And he didn't want to at first. We had, we had murder with him over it. And eventually he said, you've got to get off this bike and you've, you've got to have a nap. And the first thing he said, what did my young clips, bear in mind, he's like this all over the road. Is he said to me, James, start to stop watching. That's the first thing he said when he got off the bike. And he got in the, got in the um, he said, I only need 20 minutes, start a stop watch. And he got on the back of the van. We all had to get out the van so we could fit, fit in the van. And he took his 20-minute nap. And what was really clear to me in that moment was the fact that he knew exactly what he needed to do. He had no doubt, no... He knew it was hard, knew it was crap. But he had no doubt in his mind what had to be achieved for him to hit his goal. And his goal was to finish this race. His goal was to actually podium one of this race, which he did. But it, he knew what needed to be done and what strategy and what processes had to be in place for him to achieve that. And that meant, God, you must have needed to sleep for hours, days, yeah. start the stopwatch. Once I have 20 minutes, I'll be able to cycle the straight line again. And I think we all need at this point with four weeks to London or 10 weeks to Worlds to take a little bit of that mentality and be like, there's got to be moments where we want to, you know, unclip off the bike and not get back on it for a little while. And I think we, it, there's got to be a moment that mental toughness during that race where you're going to want to do the same. And it's got to be about really setting that goal and going, what have I got to do to get this? Um, I am over time and I'm horrendously bad at that. Um, but are there any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask. Um, and Emma and Claire, if you've got anything you want to add? You're all good. Thank you so much. I think there was a couple of questions in the chat. So... If you want to dive into the chat, I think there's maybe three questions there for you. So we've done that. Have I seen that? There's only two ones. Um, is that clear? We're going to go for two to three, depending on where you're yeah, going. Yeah, no, in. I just think whatever you miss. So I know we got the um, the one week before because you spoke about taper. Um, obviously, recommendations for actually building that mental toughness. I think that could be, obviously, you kind of spoke a bit about simulations, but... You know, how else can people build that mental toughness? That mental toughness does come down to some of that as is the strategy. And that doesn't have to be a simulation, but it does have to be a, an element of, you know, the compromised run where you're doing um recovery. Um, where you have to do stuff like you know, 400 meter run off the back of 
20 goblin squads with a semi-difficult, you know, kettlebell and knowing that you've got 10 of these reps to do. And it's it's having that strategy in place that, you know, okay, I'm four in, I'm not even halfway. If I do one more, at least I'm halfway and breaking it into chunks, breaking it into little segments. And I think breaking anything into segments always works nicely. It's getting to the bare piece and knowing I'm over halfway. This sucks. Babies are horrible. But I'm not. This is this is halfway. And the worst is back. The worst is done. The sled push, sled pull, babies, gross. The rest of it, farmers carry, row. I can do them. Like that's that's done. I can walk some of the one if I have to. Like it's fine. There's no try not to. But you know, if I need to take a second and catch my breath, that's you know, these stations coming up. You've only got to get to halfway and you're like, I'm nearly there. And it's that building that mental toughness within your sessions and having these grueling 60 minutes to 90 minute sessions, like depending on where you're at, is kind of knowing that like once you've done that, being able to, like, you might not know, um, I'm pretty sure Claire and Emma know a guy called David Goggins, and they call it um, dipping into the cookie jar. And it's like knowing that you've done this horrible stuff in the past to then go into the past and be like, I've done that. If I've done that, I can do this. And that can be as simple as, I've done a 10K race. I've run 10 miles. That took me an hour and a half. I can do this. And it's knowing at those moments that you can rely on that and kind of be like, yeah, my, my feet are killing me right now. I maybe didn't pick the right shoes. Should have listened to Emma. But I can do it. I'm still going to make this through. And it's, it's, it's about challenging yourself in those moments. And it's, I think that's why we race, though. I think that's why I race. I like to find these stupid extreme races and kind of go, what am I made of? It's it's a test. And so we all fall down at times. So if it does, it doesn't, it's not your day. There's another higher up around the corner. They're all over the place. We can get we can do another one. We can come back stronger and go again. So it's not the end of the world. And I don't want to put too much pressure on it, but building that resilience and testing yourself and training is um is the best way of really pushing the envelope for that. Um, and then yeah. just jumping in there, we just another question there is obviously doing your first high rocks as a pair. Um, what do you recommend for training? And then how should you break down each of your exercises between the two of you? Do you want to take that? You feel like you've got yeah. more. <laughs> so obviously we we do high rocks together, right? So for us, I think when we did it, did our very first one, I'll be honest, I was a lot stronger at the sub work. I'm just naturally stronger generally. Um background back in the day used to be throwing so my body is like used to moving big things and shifting stuff around and I've done a lot of crossfit as well so like strength endurance is my thing so for me on the sled when we were doing it I knew I'd take the lead so Claire would do the first one and then I'd do the next three so that she was then recovered enough to run and then I could jump back in on the run afterwards so that's what's great about high rocks in pairs there's no like person a must do half of it person b must do this and like in terms of doing that when you're training fine genuinely be honest with your partner whoever it is and tell them what your strength is you know if you're in a mixed double and you're that gal bless you you're probably not going to want to push that sled and if you are it's probably going to be really tough and take a lot out of you so really consider you know can you maybe push one sled and then your partner's going to take the rest or it could be that as running, you're very different running speeds. It's something we see a lot, um, especially in the mix, but also in just same sex doubles. If you have a different running pace, okay, well, then that person knows that their priority in training is probably going to be running. And the other person is going to be right. Well, I know they're going to come off the run and be far more fatigued. So the second person needs to be prepared to go into the station. For example, whenever we race, Claire will always start the station pretty much always it's like our fail safe unless we've communicated on the run that we're we're blowing like when we did Manchester this year I think we came off I want to say it was maybe the run into the lunge and I was like Claire I'm done my, my legs are gone they just couldn't go after the row into that next run and I was like I, I need you to take the bulk of this so I literally did maybe 10 20 lunges and then just passed off she did pretty much two thirds and I took the last third before we ran again so just know that with that, that breakdown, really communicate with your partner, try and get some training sessions in with them. Hopefully you're at the same gym so you can see how you work. And my biggest thing that we communicate the entire time, like there's always a conversation. You go, cool, I'm going to take it, whether it's a little like 
word you say that means switch or something like that. Just have that open communication because that is the biggest thing in doubles. The last thing you want is your partner to be sprinting off ahead and you having to like drag on the back and they haven't spoken to you or said, hey, I'm going to struggle here or I might struggle on this next run. So for me on, on doubles, do you know what? Communication is is the massive thing. And also, I think also dropping your ego when you're in a double, because I know you want you'll make your partner to succeed. But ultimately, if you drop your ego and say, hey, I'm struggling, you know that they're going to pick up, like support your back. So for me, communication, be all and end all is, is the key thing there. I think I think playing it smart with that is you know is the most important thing. Know your partner well and try and find time. I've only done one doubles and unfortunately we didn't actually get the opportunity to train together beforehand. We knew roughly we could run around the same pace, but it's like working well and having that open open and honest conversation mid race. And I think we don't want Mary throwing him under the bus. You know he loves me. Um, we had that opportunity of like coming in and like him him being fatigued, like off like say going into the ski. So it'd be like okay, I'll start the ski. I'll do. 250 you have you know 30 seconds to get your breath back while i'm doing that you take the middle portion of the ski give me a quick 30 seconds to get my breath back i'll finish it and then you've got another quick second to get your breath back before we go on that one again because you're gonna have to keep up with me because you're meant to like if he needs to and he needs to drop back it has to happen you have to come in together that's the way it works but he needs to tell me that and then that means that i need to do a little bit more on the next bit to give him that opportunity and especially the back half at the start of it try and get your partner to the middle portion of it so they can get the breath from the run and to the run to be able to go again um and that was like i said i've only no experts in the doubles i've only done the one of them but it's by being strategic about knowing your partner but also you can't emphasize it enough just tell them if i'm gassed I'm, I'm, I'm blowing you. You're going to have to do me a favor. And all they can say is, I ain't got it either. And then you know what? You do two more balls each and you keep going until the job's done. Um, I've yeah. seen a question from that about post event recovery. Best thing you can do recovery post wise? Rest. Rest. Do not rest and recover. <laughs> like get some good protein in. There's plenty of great like uh, brands for that, you know, in terms of marketing. Some good food. Like food's always the number one source of it. Go get some. If you're not a vegan, like chicken or something simple, get some good solid meat. And you're vegans, plenty of other sources of it, um, protein supplements, all the rest of it. Get some good protein in. Get some sleep. Sleep even even post recovery event. I'm talking post hard session. You, you're an athlete. If you're training for higher rocks, I don't care if you do it in an hour or you're doing it in two hours. If you're training six seven hours a week, you're an athlete. Like regardless if you consider yourself the other or not, you need to be getting seven hours minimum sleep, preferably eight. If you can do it, now I hope we all have work life and all the rest of it going on. But post event recovery, sleep is key, and you've got to be hyped as well. Bear in mind, sometimes these events finish quite late. I always find it quite difficult to sleep. Like, take a melatonin. I don't know. Get get to, get to sleep. Get like you need to get get to bed. Get recovery and get eight hours in because there's nothing more, um, nothing more important at that stage than to try and shake it out. The next day, probably completely rest. The day after, if you've got it jump on a spin bike. I don't mean for a spin class. I mean for turning the legs. You're building up a hell of a lot of lactic acid when you're training and when you're racing. Your legs are going to feel trashed. I think Nats asked this question because she's just smashed uh, Barcelona. So she's actually wrecked right now is the probable cause of this question. You need to get yourself on a spin bike now and start flushing these legs out and go to bed. Uh, not at the same time. That'd be really impressive. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's the idea. It's flush it out, spin the legs, try and get rid of the lactic acid, uh, um, acid and get some good, good food and good sleep. Look, after yourself um yeah does anyone else have any questions burning questions that they want to get off the chest confession that as well that i can just say on recovery one of the biggest things again this is probably more marathon but also high rocks you will see a lot probably on social media people getting back into high intensity training really quick after a, an event and don't get me wrong like for some people if they are highly trained then sure but one thing i would say from like a a coach perspective is I see people that will do a higher ox on say the Saturday and then by like Thursday, they're smashing themselves in a really high intensity session. And it's, it looks cool for Instagram, right? It looks cool for social, but your body is still recovering from a massive event. And the thing is, it's not just the event itself. We forget about like the adrenaline, the nerves, all these extra hormones that are flushing through your system. That's exhausting, right? So 
like obviously I say done high rocks myself, I will literally not do a high intensity session for a minimum of a week after I've done high rocks. Like zone twos, maybe I might do a zone two if I feel it okay in the back end of the week, more for my mental, more than anything. Yeah. But I will literally not do it. And like, again, I don't think I've got too much. There's, there's a few marathoners on here, but like half marathons, I'm not doing intensity for two weeks after a half marathon. For a marathon, close to three, four weeks. Like recovery is the biggest thing, as you were saying about sleep, that is literally slept on, right? If you can get your recovery nailed, take that week off. Don't be afraid to do it. Nail your sleep every night. Get those eight, seven, eight hours. Dial in your nutrition. And then a week later, you'll be fighting fit and raring to go to conquer that next race. Rather than starting your training early, being in the bin still and being like, oh, I'm just weak. Why can't I do anything? And just making it more negative. So yeah, that's, my, injured as well. that's my thing. Yeah, it's how you get injured. You come back a little bit too soon. You feel fine, but actually you still, you know, you still got a bit of something going on somewhere and you might not even realize it. And you end up pulling something and then your next race is down the pan. Like, and that is the same as I was talking about earlier, but that that periodization, we take the four weeks, the fifth week, we really come back and scale it back. Because I've got athletes who go, Yeah, but I've done another session because I felt all right. That's not the point. Like it's really not the point. The point here is to recover and rest. We all got to do it. I don't care. Like Hunter McIntyre does the guy at the front. Like it's the way to do it. Like promise you. So don't be afraid to recover. Your muscles are working hard. Give them a little bit of time. Let them shake it out. Fuel your body right. Um, and you know we come back stronger. 